Well, recently, Andrew Selly uh, addressed the issue of prophecy, the role of the prophetic, and actually how God has been disciplining his people through it in these current times. And so we want to ask some follow-up questions, uh, just a, a time to consider the practicalities, to consider how we navigate this thing and value it and yet uh, treat it properly. I think if we, if we establish uh, in ourselves as a movement that we believe that the prophetic is for today, uh, we believe it is not only valuable, but necessary for the church. We believe in 1 Corinthians 14 verse 1, it says that we should eagerly desire uh, the gifts and especially that of prophecy. But then also that a, a gift can uh, be legitimate, but wielded illegitimately. Uh, and that the answer to uh, the abuse of a gift is not to avoid that gift, but it's to use it correctly. Uh, so guys, let's talk about the, the prophetic uh, gift. Let's talk about prophecy. And let's think about just the definition of it, just what it essentially is and, and what it isn't. I think what we've seen in recent years is mass activations across the body of Christ in the prophetic, which is a really good thing. Uh, and yet within that, sometimes we end up with something that's not quite necessarily prophecy. Uh, it can be something like somebody standing up and saying, um, I, I feel there's people here who are discouraged, uh, for example, which is, well, you know, well done. You'll find that anywhere. Uh, what do we, when we talk about prophecy, what are we talking about? I mean, prophecy, prophecy really at the end of the day is when an individual hears the Lord for a group of people and shares that. Uh, uh, and so it needs to really, ideally, in the true broad sense of the word, it's just somebody hearing what Jesus is saying or the Spirit is saying and bringing that through with communication into a context. You want to add to that? Yeah, and, and the, re the reason for that is um, Ephesians 2 speaks about the foundation of the church being that of the apostle and the, and the, and the prophetic. And the picture that just coins it well for me is that, that of the apostolic, the architect, the mind of God, the understanding of how God builds, the understanding of, you know, and then the prophetic is, is really the revelation of, of, of the heart of God. And, and I've seen that partnership many a times where, where the mind of God, the architect, that knows how to lay the foundation, and then there's this, the heart of God is now infusing the building. And I've seen it, it come alongside the apostolic in such a way. You know, we, we're talking about um, the what it is, for me, in, in the simplest terms, you know, it's, it's really Jesus being revealed to the heart of the ones he loves, you know. And, 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 uh, and there are times where it's, it's, it brings accuracy, it, uh, you know, discipline, or it brings warning. But in the very heart of it, it's the Father reaching towards the beloved ones, you know. So if we're all told to eagerly desire the gift, then you should have entire churches who are able to prophesy. We're all able to prophesy. At what point does a person cross over from uh, receiving a word of prophecy, but maybe it's an isolated event, and actually uh, being a prophet, uh, being a person who's prophetically gifted? At what point does that transition? I mean, I definitely think that uh, our dream certainly is that where Paul says, I eagerly desire the great, great gifts, especially the gift of prophecy. And I think because every one of us can hear Jesus, we, the, my sheep will hear my voice, I think it's only natural that if I can hear him for me, I can hear him for you. And so we do want to and trust that our people will all be able to prophesy and that would be a, a prophetic culture, that there'd be a sense of the church knows how to hear the Lord together. And that's also how we discern his will. But definitely there's a sense that certain people are set apart uniquely, uh, differently from the rest of us. And they would then obviously carry that mandate or that unique calling or destiny that this is entwined into who they are. It's like God has made them to be that. And, and they would then be classified as a prophet. And, and in that sense, how do you discern that? It's, a, it's an interesting, it's a difficult question yeah. because it's not like there's a manual that says, oh, well, that's what makes a prophet. But generally you would probably find like Paul and Barnabas, you know, they were with a bunch of guys and the Holy Spirit said, set apart for me, Paul and Barnabas for, you know, to be apostles really in this case. So there'd be a sense that the wider body would begin to discern that this person isn't just a prof, not just prophesying like the rest of us. There's something on them as a distinct, unique calling that this is now entwined in the person and, uh, and that it, it'd be recognized by others. And I think probably undergirded by the individual 
Paul saying, Paul called to be an apostle, the unique belief in that person that they also are called to function in that way or to play that role within the church. So it's one of those things where it's discerned and it's sensed, we, we sense that. Um, uh, and then it's appointed probably at the end of the day by the laying on of hands or recognition of those who are in government within the local church. That's great. So, so Merv, if we think about uh, receiving prophetic words, we want to think about being in an environment where uh, the prophetic is, is in operation and, and words are coming to people. How, what would you say to someone who is afraid of that type of environment because of the variables? Uh, we know the prophetic must come through an earthly vessel and so there's things that can go wrong. And, and I think people can genuinely feel afraid of that. They can feel, what are we opening ourselves up to here? What did you say to a person who's afraid of that? No, number one, I think that, that any person that prophesies will prophesy in part. We all make mistakes. And most probably the guy that stands in front of you, there will be a couple of mistakes coming through. You know, either incorrectly interpreting a feeling or a picture. But in essence, what I would say to that person is, just underlying, or you know, all those things. There's there's a God that wants to connect with their heart, and He can speak through broken things. He can touch through broken things, you know. Um, so, but what I would advise a person like that is is to is to have a yes in their heart for that, because there could be this special moment between them and the Father. I would encourage them. In a, in, a, in a church context, to bring in a leader next to them that can witness with the word. Maybe if they're really afraid, bring a leader next to them that can witness with the word. I would receive the word. I would process it with leaders. I will process it with the word. Um, so I, I would say if you've been hurt by the prophetic in the past or there's just a general fear you have, this guy might just, yeah, I think, I think have that posture that God could speak, but the safe God is the leadership you're bringing in and the processing with leadership, the word that's that that's being uh, uh, that you're receiving. I want to just add something that Andrew says frequently, you know, and I love that statement because when I came into Just Jesus, I've never heard anyone say that actually. And that just it just set me free on a whole different level. And a lot of guys have been processing through the prophetic in regards to either waiting for the fulfillment of a word or, you know, was this the Lord speaking or I'm confused about this prophetic word. And Andrew would always say, we, we don't follow prophecy, we follow Jesus. And in following Jesus, we stumble into the prophetic. And that, that is most probably the best safeguard that any person can have, is to honor, receive, it's going to come through maybe broken, maybe they, they do miss it, but, but, but you follow Jesus. And I, and I think that's just something that I would like to see in, 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 the, in the prophetic culture of of any church or church movement. Yes, that's great. So what would you, what would you say to someone who, who takes that and embraces it, and yet within them there's a feeling, I've got to do something as well. Like I, I follow Jesus and I, I, I know he will, I believe he will lead me, but am I meant to be preparing myself? Am I meant to be gathering people around me according to what has been told to me? Uh, what steps should I be taking that are proactive? Would I dishonor God if I don't take proactive steps to do something? Uh, how should a person navigate that type of thing? I think for me, it, it depends on the nature of the prophetic word that came through. You know, um, it's a very directional. Is, 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 there, is there prompting to, towards future events or to future things? You know, but in spite of that, I think to process and if there's a witness with leadership in regard to this thing, you know, to start praying into that, I think it's a wonderful thing to do. To get scripture that 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 tags along to this thing, you can, you know. Um, so that's one of the things they can do. I've I've noticed in the prophetic, normally, God either works slowly, or very slowly. Yeah. I, I gave a prophetic word to someone um, many years ago, and I, I, randomly I received this phone call one day saying. Can we talk to you? You won't remember us. But 10 years ago, you gave us a prophetic word. And um, we, just, we just wanted to actually repent a little bit towards you. Because when you gave the word, it made no sense to us. We thought it was rubbish. We just had little, it was tapes back then. We just had a little tape thrown into the... I said, but what happened in the 10 years is my, my husband's got terminal cancer. And we're now looking for the word of the Lord. We're just reaching for anything that's available. And we got the little tape out. And um, we started listening. 
10 years later, it's making sense. Yeah. So, so don't, don't always push something away because you think this is so far. No, just, just follow Jesus. Just follow Jesus, you know. But I do think to, to, to build scripture around that word, to have a witness, you know, your leaders witnessing with what's been said, and I think that's, that's the preparation that, that, that probably, or the next step you can take in that. I'll jump in there as well. You know, I think one of the worst things that happens sometimes to us is we get a prophetic word. As much as I love prophecy and I wish we'd see more of it, because the nature of human beings is that we want to make it happen. And with God, you can't make anything happen. And so what invariably happens is some guy gets a prophetic word, you know, you're called to be an apostle. Now he wants to hang out with somebody who's an apostle and you know, can I travel with you because I want to learn because I'm called to that. And I actually think that's not how the Lord works most of the time. While we need to prepare our hearts and what we think the Lord's called us to, we need to just be found faithful in what we're at. And one of the best Bible stories that illustrates this for me is the life of Joseph, who's got this ridiculous, amazing promise, you know, this dream that God's given him, a prophetic dream. And every time he tries to make it happen, it goes wrong. And he ends up in jail, forgotten, and I mean, just pit jailed. It's kind of this descending gory versus glory, you know. It looks like it's never going to happen. And then in a moment, a day, when he can't do anything about it, God suddenly opens that door and he falls into the prophecy. And it's like, oh my goodness, how did this happen? And I think the Lord is careful to guard his glory and he doesn't want to share it with us, our strength. And so I often say to young folk when they get a prophetic word, hold it in your heart and keep serving Jesus. Because if you're following Jesus, you'll fall into that prophetic word like Joseph did. And if you're faithful with a little that he's entrusted to you, whatever that is, then the Lord will enlarge what he's given you because faith with little, faithful with much. And so the Lord will test us in ways that we often don't realize and lead us even away from the promises sometimes. Because in his will, he'll bring us back at the end of the day. And when we finally walk in the promise, I think you, you know you're walking in the promise of God when you can say, the Lord did this. I did not do this. And so many times somebody gets a prophetic word and they strive and they, you know, now I'm going to make it happen. And they damage the body of Christ because they've actually worked in the flesh and the flesh wars against the spirit and actually creates great destruction. So to any young person or person getting a prophetic word, the Lord is faithful to finish his promises, but it won't be, as Merv says, it won't be the way you think. It'll be a slow, God did it. And you just be faithful. Just love your wife, serve your local eldership, Carry the right posture in your heart. You know, love the saints, make tea, do whatever. And the Lord is faithful to fulfill his promise. And uh, that's what we need to be. We just need to do what he puts in front of us. And even if no one knows about it, if it is, a, if it is something that God's got for you, even if you don't know about it, you're going to fall into it if you just follow him. So, so, so since you mentioned Joseph, uh, he had a prophetic word essentially from himself yeah. uh, or from the Lord, but yeah. to directly, no, yeah. no other people involved. Mm. Uh, in the form of a dream, which he then shared to his whole family. He got in trouble. <laughs> which you could make a good case that he, he shouldn't have, maybe. Yeah. Uh, I think many people actually feel that God has told them things about their futures or even marriage partners, things like that. Uh, what should a person do when they felt like God has spoken to them very clearly about their own lives? Should they, how many people should they share that with? What should they do in terms of uh, building up their own faith in it, um, but, but sort of making it known to people around them? You know, I love the story. Again, Joseph being one example shares with his brothers and they, they really don't process that well. So I do think it's a wisdom to who you share what you believe the promises of God are to you personally. Mary, when she heard about Jesus being her son, hid the promises in her heart. So I do think it's a place that you want to be careful where you share the promises. But at the same time, you know, if we believe in uh, leadership, govern, eldership governed churches. We believe that elders work closely with as shepherds over the sheep. And it's a good thing to sit down with a leader in humility and just say, hey, just so that you know, I'm not expecting you to suddenly open a door for me or, you know, now I'm the prophet in the church or whatever it is that was said over me. But just so that you know, this was said of me. Do you witness with it? And I just want to lay that at your feet. I'm going to just carry on serving. But just so that you know, that's something that I think God's spoken to me. And if you ever think that there are things that I can do to, to help me move in that direction or things that might shape me, I'm, I want to be submitted to you as a shepherd. Would you, would you lead me through that process? And I do believe that shepherds will shepherd you into your destiny as the Lord uh, you know, works. So I think it's one of those things where you've got to hide it on one side and then share it with, with those that are mature and spiritual, just so that they know 
that that is something that maybe you feel that's in your heart or that the Lord has said to you. Because I do, I think as leaders, our responsibility is to see every person walking in their destiny. And while sometimes the Lord does tell me what a person's destiny is, sometimes it's nice that they also believe that that's their destiny. Or, gee, I didn't see that, but now that you've said that, let me go and just watch and pray and see. Because invariably, if that calling is something that God's put on you, it does become obvious to everyone at some point. Yeah. I want to jump in there just uh, to, to just strengthen that case again. So many times I've, I've had people's lives falling apart, either a move from Pretoria to Cape Town, or Cape Town to Pretoria, or I'm, I'm leaving my job and I'm now, I, because of a personal word they received from the Lord, but never processing that mm. with, with leaders and with, with shepherds. And I, I, this week I was sitting down with, with, with a person that, that that felt he heard from the Lord and certain things I could witness with. But there were other things that just wasn't aligning with scripture. If he would blindly follow that word, he will end up bringing destruction to his family. But I could sit and process and say, this part here, I don't know. You know? And, and, I, and, and, I, and I do agree with Andrea and, and I, I just want to you know, strengthen that case again because I've seen guys, that's, that's the one area they make the most mistakes. It's not processed well with leaders and leaders aren't being brought into that journey with them. Either witnessing uh, 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 or warning or correcting. You know? And that's the safeguard. There is order within the house of the Lord. And when that order is honored and, and you give yourself towards that, you know, there's blessing that comes out of that. I mean, yeah, again, one of the things, just picking up on that, is the danger... You know, I'm not scared of prophecy. I'm scared of me. I'm scared of my own evil, my own heart, my own ability to self-deceive. And the Bible says, submit yourselves one to another that are reverence for Christ. So there's got to be that sense of we are connected with the body and there's leaders in the body that will help us. And, uh, and, and again, you know, you're thinking of a story of, I remember somebody felt they wanted to move to Australia and they were going to go to, like, I think it was Sydney. And so the one day they walked outside and the host pup was lying in an S in their garden. And they were like, oh, the Lord's spoken, there's an S, you know, I need to go to Sydney. And I was like, Gee, I don't know if that's the Lord speaking to you as much as you just want to go to Sydney because you're scared of living in South Africa and you're actually running out of fear, not out of faith. You're justifying it, but it's not a true, you know, I don't think you've heard the Lord. And, and, but that person, if they left to their own devices... They can run and do things that actually are wrong. You, you're building on the wrong foundation. If you move somewhere out of fear, not out of faith, you actually sin. Because anything that's not of faith is sin. And then you expect the Lord to bless you in that place where James specifically says, don't say I'm going to go here or there, earn a living or do this and the next thing, unless the Lord clearly says to me. So I do think it's that place where we need to work things through with local elders who really are responsible uh, to help us keep in step with the Lord and make sure we don't, hear the Lord and go straight, because we can all do that very easily. Uh, I can do that. We need, a, we need those around us that can yeah. witness and, yeah, this is the Lord. No, that's not the Lord. And, uh, and then work that through very carefully. I mean, it could have been swelling down. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so, Andrew, you shared in your word to the churches about uh, just what's happening in the world with people making prophetic declarations and then being provably false, uh, you know, could not have been accurate. What do we do with a person who, who maybe has prophesied into a, a church or a specific context and, and given words that were certainly deemed accurate and then later on has been disgraced or uh, been proven to be a, like a charlatan or whatever, at whatever level? What does a person who has received that word now in the past think now? What are they supposed to do with that? You know, I don't think there is perfect prophecy because we prophesy in part. So everything that comes has got a little bit of a taint in it. And I think the danger is that we discard everything because, well, it wasn't perfect. It'll only be perfect, the Bible says, when Jesus returns, then we'll be as he is. Until then, it's this mismatch kind of thing. And so again, when a word comes, you know, I think we need to try and uh, weigh the word. Um, at the same time, it's always good to, I always, I just personally, I do listen through, I try and listen through, uh, that person's theology. So let me illustrate what I mean. Um, you know, if a person comes to us out of a bad theology or a church that's got bad theology, th theology will shape prophecy because the spirit of the prophet is subject to the control of the prophet. So if that guy has this prosperity doctrine, gospel, he's going to prophesy 
prosperity. No matter what the Lord says, he's going to work that through the lens. His own spirit will taint that word with prosperity. And so I do then want to try and weigh that word through the person. Ideally, if people are connected properly into apostolic prophetic churches, you know, their theology should be good if the apostles are laying foundations theologically. So their prophetic prophecy is probably going to be more better and more accurate theologically, which means it won't be tainted. But at the same time, even though I do get a word from a person that might be totally, you know, messed up in charlatan, I always say I don't follow prophecy, I follow the Lord. So all I'm going to do is I'm going to I stick those things in my back pocket and trust that at some point, if it is the Lord, it, it'll come to pass. And that others, there'll be other witnesses witnesses to that word you know the lord every matter must be established by two more witnesses so you know if i find the lord keeps speaking that thing to me i know that it's the lord and even if it came through a false prophet uh, or someone that's been you know sinned in some area at the end of the day it they could have prophesied the truth i mean in the old testament there's a guy called i've gone blank on his name he's a guy balaam who who prophesies i mean i don't think that guy's even serving the lord but he actually prophesies over israel the very words of god and it's an amazing thing that God could even use here a false prophet to prophesy the very words of God uh, into a scenario. And then another scenario is Micaiah, who prophesies to Ahab, and he's a true prophet, and he prophesies a lie and literally says, go into battle against you know, the king of Syria, you're going to win, knowing that he's actually going to is actually going to die in that battle. And then later he has to clarify that. So there's a definite sense that you know we've got to... Hold these things dearly, but at the same time, lightly, and follow the Lord, because He is faithful to finish what He starts, and yeah, the words do work their way out. And, and essentially, God can use a, a crooked stick to draw a straight line. Always. And I mean, we are all crooked sticks. There's none of us that's yet like He is. So I mean, even though some of us as elders might be more whole than, than, than maybe you know, our peers or people around us in the marketplace to some degree, um, we're still cracked. We're not yet perfect. We don't yet see fully as he is. So everything we do comes with a little bit of a taint in it. And I, I think we've got to just realize that the Lord is comfortable to work with that and often does work with very broken vessels. You just go look at the patriarchs in the scriptures. I mean, Abraham, the father of all who believe, and he lies about his wife because he's scared that the king of, you know, the king of Egypt is going to maybe do damage to him. And I'm thinking, geez, there's not a lot of faith there for the father of our faith. He, 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 um, Ishmael, which is actually he tries to help God along instead of trying trusting God, and, and, and Ishmael is merged, which becomes a, a, an enemy of the people of God, an en of the true Isaac, of the true promise. Um, and so, yeah, God uses broken vessels, and that's okay. We just, we just love Him, we hear Him in part, and the parts that we do, we hold on to, and we follow Him, and we end up falling into His purposes. Hey, Andrew, I just want to highlight that again. Uh, I think what you're saying is so vital and so good. And I almost feel like I want to I want to just shine the spotlight a little bit more on this and massage it into, at least in our context, at least massage it into the into the prophetic climate of, of our people. Is is that, you know, when receiving a word from the Lord, we we don't want to take it too lightly because, you know, it's God speaking. It's God reaching towards the heart. You know, and we want to, but at the same time, we can't hold it too tightly. Yeah. And it's the tension between not holding it too tightly and not holding it too lightly, but following Jesus in it. And I like the example that you used. You know, I get a word. I'm not disregarding it. I'm holding on to it, but I'm, it's in the back pocket. And I follow Jesus hard, you know. And in that process, you just stumble into, into it. And, and, and I do like that, you know. I, many times when, when we've flown in the prophetic, uh, the Lord has prophesied, and it's like seeds falling into a field only to be watered years later. But the seeds are in the field. It's there. And, and, and I've noticed that sometimes people give themselves too quickly, too aggressively to a word, and they end up missing the mark of where this thing was supposed to take them. So I just thought I'd, I'd highlight that again. Not too light, not too tight, but follow Jesus. That's great. So let's think about the, the concept of a, of a false prophet. Uh, which today it's very easy to label someone as that. And yet we very clearly see it in the word. There will be false prophets. So at what point uh, on the spectrum does someone transition from maybe just being someone who brought an inaccurate word, uh, a wrong word, into actually uh, essentially the role of a false prophet? They've now become a false prophet. It's a, it's a challenging question because it's not a... It's not an easy answer, you know. I think in some degrees, because we're all a little bit broken, 
in some degrees we're all a little bit false, but then there comes a point where you're still okay, you're still accepted within, this is an accurate prophet, even though he's maybe 80% accurate. And then you get the point where that oak is so dangerous, don't go near him with a 10-foot pole, you know. And I do think, again, what makes this thing challenging is I do think prophecy is more shaped by theology than we realize. So uh, again, and I think that the theology of much of the Christian church today around the world, Western world, is very broken, it's very whack. It's, it's, it's been perverted by you know, historical junk. And so what you end up coming is a guy coming into a church and he ends up prophesying into certain things. Uh, and this becomes very dangerous. So an example would be Someone who comes out of a prosperity type gospel, or you know, uh, there's a teaching now that the church must take seven mount the seven mountains of influence, which again is nowhere in the Bible. But we built this whole theological premise of how the church must influence society outside of preaching the gospel. And and so a guy will come in if he's been schooled in that way of thinking theologically as a prophet, the spirit of the prophet, subject to the control of the prophet, he will interpret what he sees through his theological grid. So if you're a young leader and he sees you're a young leader and you've got a little company going, uh, you know, he, he picks up the leadership on your life. He prophesies through the grid of his theology and he sees that, you know, you're going to be an apostle to the marketplace and God's going to cause you to have influence in the marketplace and you're going to, you know, but he's, the problem is we don't see outside of the preaching of the gospel in the marketplace, we don't see anywhere in the New Testament an apostle to the marketplace. We've now created a separate ministry category that's not actually even connected to the church. It's like, so you've got all these independent business breakfasts now with all these apostles to the marketplace and they're like a church of their own, but they're not connected back into the body of Christ. And it's actually bad theology creating, bad prophecy creating bad theology and bad living, you know. And so I do think that there's a lot of bad right now. And, and again, I think we need to come back to apostolic foundations where the theology of the church is rooted well in the New Testament so that what comes out is, is good. Then within that framework, I, I think you know, looking at a, a prophet who goes from you know, false to true, I think it's got to be ultimately discerned. I think the local elders working with the apostles need to discern that's a healthy prophet into this context. He might not be perfect, but that's healthy and that's not healthy. Um, we wouldn't have that person minister off our pulpits because they would end up dispersing the body of Christ because of bad thinking, bad theology or major character glitches, which obviously would also do a lot of damage. But it needs to be discerned by local eldership, by working with apostles, and to actually name someone as a false prophet. Let me say this. There's a lot of people that I wouldn't have in our church that I wouldn't call a false prophet because I think they, they're so whack in their thinking. I don't want them near my children, as it were. But at the same time, uh, if there is a false prophet within us, we would need to start to discern that. You would normally see that by bad character, because bad character will eventually shape shape theology and it'll shape a gift and then um, you would have to eventually silence that person you know warn that person because they are creating problems and I think the local elders working with the apostles need to do that effectively and warn the people about that person because that person will be dangerous so I think it's something that's got to be done in the moment as the situation bears itself and outside of that there's space to get it wrong a little bit to weigh these things through to work it through carefully and um Hopefully we get you to the other side. That's it again, making my point. Don't open the pulpit to anyone and everyone who calls himself a prophet, because you can destroy the church if someone comes in with a, a deep crack in them. I remember, it, just by way of illustration, I'm taking too long now, but um, I remember a guy, one of the Bible, the Bible says that sometimes a prophet will prophesy into the idols or the, the, the idols of your heart. And then another scripture says, the secrets of your heart are laid bare before the prophet. If a prophet comes in with a man-pleasing spirit and he picks up that you have ambition to do whatever, to be an elder, he can prophesy into the idol of your own heart because he picks it up and he reads your heart. He's, he's got a gift of discernment. He can use discernment and a broken character and prophesy into the idol of your heart. Now there's a problem because that might not be what the Lord's called you to, but now you're fighting and you feel justified that, you know, why haven't the elders recognized what, what I'm called to? And you end up leaving the church, whatever it is, because you didn't get your recognition actually it was just an idol in your own heart. So again, it needs to be worked through carefully with local eldership, uh, with apostles and uh, another prophets who can test those words and making sure that we can try and keep the church in, safe, in a safe space. That's great. Uh, you know, uh, and, uh, again, it's, it's such a difficult question. Um, Thank you. But I've, yeah, <laughs> but I've noticed, I've noticed those who, who I would feel unsafe with or, uh, you know, I would be very nervous 
to uh, you know, let them come in and, and, and prophesy. What I've seen in those guys, they are islands, independent. Totally. independent. They, they're not submitting to, to the apostolic. They're not there. They stand alone. They, they're unrepentant. They would miss the mark a couple of times, but there's just an arrogance and an ignorance in them. You know, uh, I've, I've, I've seen that. Um, the other thing I wanted to say in, in regards to this. Can I jump in there quickly? Oh, yeah. The other thing is, I think we've got a problem in the prophetic uh, that the super prophets are often ministering outside of the local context and not immersed within the local church. You know, Paul, who is an apostle of apostles, says, you know my way of life, how I lived among you for your sake. He was very much a part of the church. He was a brother. Well, I think now we've got these superstar prophets that travel around on these global platforms, really accountable to no one or maybe accountable to some pastor or apostle out there, but they, they, they're above. They're not a part of. And I think that is dangerous. I think we need to come to a place where they're apostles and the prophets, everyone is living with the saints. We're brothers first and then we flow in the gift because the brothers know our lives. And I think we need to bring the church back to that place where well, you know my life, you know how I live, Paul could say. Every prophet should be able to say that within his local church context, that he's not over and above and beyond, but that he's first a saint and then out of that humble place of service, he, he serves the body of Christ. Uh, yeah. That's the first thing I'm looking at. Yeah. That's the first thing I, I want to, you know, I want to see. And we're talking about Ephesians 4.11. You know, the, the, the gifts given unto the church. And, and, and firstly, it's not given unto the nations. It's given unto the church to equip the saints for the work of the ministry. And, and I always find that the healthy guys are the guys who somehow are working through on ground level within a local context. They're the guys pitching there on a seven on a Sunday morning, and they hardly have any prophetic words or any prophetic flow, but they're serving the people, equipping the people. They're amongst their saints. Somehow those guys, when released and when the Lord does speak, they carry something of a weight within them. They, 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 are, they can be trusted. They are just walking in accountability. They're walking in vulnerability. They are being discipled at the same time, you know, and they're not above that. And for me, that's vital for any measure of prophetic health within a church context. Yeah. Can I jump in as well? Another thing is we need to test it on the scriptures. I mean, I saw a prophet in our country recently who's got a massive following. Literally do this uh, on one of his profile social, social media posts. Literally do this. You have had a, a difficult period over the last while. It's been a dark period. But the Lord says to you today that from this message, God is going to bring sunshine and light and it's going to be an amazing period. Say yes, believe it and it'll be true for you. And so, I mean, literally thousands of people are commenting, thank you so much, prophet, I received that word. My world has now changed. And I'm thinking, oh my goodness, you've just put some, it's like a horoscope that you put out in a newspaper that now every single person who's been through a hard period, just by hearing what you've said, you've just changed the destiny of the whole planet because you said it. God deals with this individually and he speaks to you individually and he might be disciplining somebody who's in rebellion. There's no way that that's going to lift because some prophet said it's going to be different because he said it. It's, you, you can prophesy into individuals and into scenarios. And so the body of Christ has lost its marbles with these things. And now this is a, probably one of the most popular prophets in our country. Thousands following him and now they they're all saying, well, the prophet blessed me and he didn't bless you. He just put a general word out trying to get social media coverage and try and grow his platform. And you all believed it and bought into it. There's a deep problem here. This is not true prophecy. This is at best witchcraft and it's got nothing to do with the spirit of Christ. I just want to come alongside Andrew with that. Something I've been feeling in my heart throughout this whole conversation is, is I'm really sensing that, you know, is, is that the prophetic in general needs a far greater dose of the fear of the Lord. Yeah. It feels to me in many ways that we've been disconnected from that, that, that part, that side of, of you know, the, the fear of the Lord. You know, and, and it's always intention, the love of God and the fear of the Lord. You'll find that these two things are inseparable. You can't, you, it's not the one, it's, it's always both. You know, and as much as the prophetic comes and it's to exhort, it's to edify, it's to comfort, it always comes with the fear of the Lord. You know, it's like the river banks. You know, the fear of the Lord, the banks, the, the, the love of God is the river. You can't separate these two, but it feels to me as if the prophetic is a little bit disconnected from the fear of the Lord. And I remember there's actually a guy I would recognize as a prophet in, in the States. Many years ago, we were doing a prophetic conference with him. And uh, he hardly prophesied the whole conference. He equipped, he taught, he, he gave one word, like in a week. And, and this is, you, I, I thought coming in, he would be like... You know, one word, taught, that's it. 
And we, we were talking about this right at the end of the conference. I said to him, well, you know, just like the one word. And we thought like, and he said to me, you know, I just, I fear the Lord when it comes to speaking on his behalf. Yeah. And, and he said, I would speak only if I feel like if I don't speak now, I'll disobey. I don't force that gift. I don't force that grace. And that's safe. That's safe. So whenever he does then prophesy, people's ears are listening. Because he's just not throwing out and shooting. There's a great measure of the fear of the Lord. Because we're going to stand before the Lord for the things we spoke on his behalf. You know, it's like that's, I've found myself in, in especially the last four or five years, you know, just I'm not prophesying. I actually don't want to. Not because I don't desire to prophesy. I want God to speak. But understanding the weight and the implication of it, I'd rather just not say anything. But then when I'm prompted to, you know what I'm saying? So, so I feel like almost the more, the more I grow in, in the prophetic thing and the, and the more you know, I understand the, 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 the doctrine of, of how God builds church and how, you know, I, I feel like I don't want to prophesy. But I do want to, you know what I'm saying? And I think that's, that's that health coming in. So to take it to a very practical example, uh, you know, one of the lead elders in, in the 412 field of churches is a Sunday meeting. And, and you're trying your best to make room for the Holy Spirit to, to build the church up. A visitor comes in and comes to you and says, I've got a word from God for this congregation. What do you do in that moment? It's always challenging when someone comes from the outside because you don't know them. So you, you, know, you think, whoa, what's going to happen? So I think it's good to ask, what, what is you feeling? And try and discern in the moment. You can, you can quite quickly discern the spirit of a person or the spirit of what they're saying. And to try and read the, read the person as best you can because once that's released, it's quite a challenge to pull it back if it's not the Lord or we have to tweak it. So I would generally do that. To hear the word, what are you feeling? Is there a witness in my heart that this is something that the Lord's saying? If there is, uh, I would then invariably say, go for it and then weigh it. The Bible says it must be tested. So if it's accurate, leave it and, or let it shape the meeting or whatever you're doing. If, uh, if it's not accurate, you'd have to then tweak it or correct it. Or if it's a, just a vague word that doesn't affect anything, you might just move on. Uh, and then... And then um, yeah, but if it, if it is a word that's whack, you've then got to then fix that. So you've then got to then up and then gen in the, in the moment, you do have to fix it if it's a genuinely a, a word that's not helpful. So you would then have to, you know, try and bring some clarity or, or sense of, okay, maybe that's not quite right. Let's pick up on this. I think the other thing is when a word comes, because sometimes the Lord does speak outside of me, you know. I'm not the, if I'm leading the meeting and I'm working with the local elders um, and, you um, you know, a guy comes with a prophetic word. Sometimes God does whack things, and I know that. So, you know, I get the word. If I witness with it, great. If I don't, I invariably might bounce it off one or two other guys. Uh, and just what are you feeling? And and all what I might do is uh, just put it in my back pocket and say, Lord, if that's you, it's so out there. I hadn't seen that coming, but I realize you are God. So would you confirm that with someone else? And invariably, I find someone comes up with a very similar word that's disconnected, you know, and says, I feel the Lord saying this. And then I start to have a sense of, okay, now the Lord is going in a direction that I hadn't planned. And so then I would get that first word up and then the second word up. And then I would then try and follow where the Lord is leading in that sense in the moment, because the Lord seems to be going somewhere that I maybe didn't anticipate, which he does from time to time. <laughs> He has been known. He has been known to go where I didn't <laughs> think you should go. <laughs> the other thing is, if, if a person is not known, coming, you know, saying, I really do feel I have a word for the church. Um, and and there's, a, there's a kind of a witness. The, the other danger is he, the, the word could, could be from the Lord, but you never know how the presentation will be. Yeah. And, and so it could be great, or it, there it could go wrong, even though, we do witness it's a word from the Lord. And that has many a times happened. You know, you open up the mic to someone that you don't know. And then, then I've been in a meeting where a guy started clapping his wings like a, and making weird sounds. But the word was good when he came. But the moment he got the mic. <laughs> the glory, glory. <laughs> you know? and it's like, and we actually, the word was even never delivered. He had to take the mic from the guy. He didn't even want to stop, you know. So what I'm saying is, 
obviously, if 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 there's a witness in you and and you and you uh, you've no concerns and it does go that way or whatever, but if, if if there's a little thing inside of you that's saying I witness with a word, I'm not sure about the the the, the delivery, and the word you feel is you go up Sorry. and you say, you know, Mike is joining us this morning. He had a word. The Lord wants to touch people with cancer. Mm. Or, or that's a word of knowledge. Or, yeah. you know, the Lord's going to bring you in, whatever. Yeah. I think that, that would be wise to do. Um, uh, uh, just because you, 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 you're keeping the meeting, you're steering the meeting where the Lord wants to take it. So when it comes to uh, actually a person listening now to what we're saying and, and is going to then trust God for prophetic words, like we all should do, and then going to give it to somebody or even be released to give it to a group. Um, I'm aware that we can often use phrases like God told me, God showed me, God says. Uh, what should we do with these phrases? Uh, we don't want to necessarily limit everything people say or be overly prescriptive, but are these phrases helpful? You know, again, to say God says, I mean, and everything you say from that point onwards suddenly is classified under God said it. So I think there's a wisdom there that we need to try and exert way. I mean, even when I feel the Lord prophetically share something with somebody else, I say, I, I have a sense, I, I think the Lord might be saying something. Uh, this is what I think he's saying to you. And I'll do it that because we prophesy in part, you know. And while I tend to be generally quite accurate myself in the prophetic when I do prophesy, uh, I can get it wrong. I've got it wrong before. Uh, and so I do think there's a humility and a posture that we need to bring where we say, you know, I feel the Lord saying this, or I believe the Lord is saying this. Uh, um, and and it just does, the phrasing of that helps a person to hear it. They can hear it easy and test the word. There's this classic story of a guy that gets up and, and, and says, you know, as with Moses who built the ark, I say, the Lord says, I'm going to do this in your life. And then, oh, sorry, the Lord says I made a mistake. It wasn't Moses, it was Noah. <laughs> and there's a sense of, you know, the gist of what he was saying was maybe true. Yeah. He, he, and he's thinking he just got the wrong person. But now the Lord, now he's got to qualify, the Lord made a mistake because he said, thus saith the Lord. Well, if you just say, oh, yeah, sorry, man, my bad. I feel the Lord saying, you know, and, and you can just bring a bit of earthiness to this, which is a bit more easy to process. <laughs> I love that. I love that. Uh, you How know. did you feel when you brought that? <laughs> <laughs> Wasn't my mistake. <laughs> it was the Lord's mistake. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, yeah, you know, I, I think there's a lot of truth. There's, a, there's actually a, a, there's a lot of camps around the, the, these things. You know, you know, there's the, the camp that feel you need to be bold. You, know, you need to be. Um, I think our viewpoint would be much of what, like, what Andrew just suggested. <laughs> so the Lord said, that kind of settles it, you know, what now? What I do with, how do I argue? And, how, and I think that, that's where a lot of the hurt comes in, actually. Mm. But, but I think to present in such a way, you know what, this is what I'm feeling. Mm. This, is, this is what I'm sensing. And I think that language is vital. It's vital. And then, again, we spoke earlier about, but those who walk in the office of a prophet. And I think that's a different category. Mm. But, but when saints minister towards saints with the gift functioning through them to edify, exhort, and, and comfort, I think the wise approach would be, you know, I, I sense, I feel, uh, you know, and, 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 and process it with the Lord, process it with leaders, or, you know. And I think, I think that's, that's crucial and that's vital um, for, 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 for health within the local context. I do. I've seen that scripture actually where it says every matter must be established by two or more witnesses. And so again, you know, because God realizes how frail we are, there needs to be the witness of others. The others are the ones that bear witness that that is the word of the Lord. It's not like I'm me saying it makes it any more or less the word of the Lord. The witness of the saints is what makes it the word of the Lord, that testimony of two or three others. And I think what we do is we take an authority that God hasn't given anyone and we say, thus say the Lord. And you think, whoa, 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 you are not writing scripture. You are not so full of the Holy Spirit that every single jot and title of the, you know, of the language that you're using is the Lord, which is what happened when they wrote the scripture. So when you bring in this through a broken lens, you know, knowing in part, prophesying in part. The problem is if you're prophesying in part, you can't then say, thus saith the Lord, because no one prophesies perfectly. And so I think there's that witness that others have that that was the Lord yeah. and what part of it was the Lord. But if you try and take an authority that, that actually the scripture doesn't give you, you actually set everyone up for pain and hurt. Do you do? And you know when the Lord is speaking. It's not like when the, when the Lord is speaking, you're not like, was that God? Yeah. Whenever the Lord speaks, you'll know. Yeah. Even if you come with that posture of, I feel, Andrew, I feel in my heart. Yeah. 
you know, and I deliver. If it's the Lord speaking, sure. he will know. Yeah. You know, I, it, it's so safe. I, I love what he's saying. Again, you know, God's heart is for his children to be safe, to be nurtured, to be equipped, to be loved. And he has built all these safeguards in so that he can reveal his heart to them and they can receive it without wolves coming in and without pain coming in and without all these things. Yeah. I think to end, guys, it would be great to just hear a story of how the prophetic has broken open something significant, maybe just in your lives and how you've seen it work and, and work powerfully. We actually have a wonderful story about the prophetic um, changing lives and churches around the world. Many years ago, I was invited to minister in Aranos of all places. And most of the people here won't know where Aranos is. It's in Namibia. And you, when you're in Namibia, you drive hours to get there yeah. <laughs> through sand dunes and nothing, you know. And uh, I, was, I was ministering in, in Namibia and I got a call to come minister on a Saturday evening at a leadership conference. And all I know was th there's a guy called Andrew Selly there. I didn't know Andrew from, from a boss up, you know. And, uh, but I said yes and took the long journey to Aranos that Saturday morning. Got there in the afternoon, set up my sound, did, did, did a sound check. We got into the meeting, got into worship. And we were just getting into that sweet place. I felt the, 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 the Holy Spirit saying to me, there's a man lying on the floor in front of you and you will prophesy to him now in regards to an apostolic move that he has had in his heart that God will raise up through him and it will touch nations. And, uh, and a lot of things around that, you know, but, but that was clear that God wanted to speak to him now. And there was, there was an urgency in the heart of God to, to speak this thing. And so I opened my eyes, we took down the music, opened my eyes, there was a guy lying on the floor, which was Andrew, I didn't know him. I just remember him being an extravagant lover. He was lying face down, crying, worshiping Jesus, and um, got his attention and started prophesying that over his life. And so on my side, um, I arrived late that night. I hadn't met Merv, I didn't know who he was, he didn't know who I was. I was just somebody in the meeting as far as he was concerned. And I'm worshiping the Lord, uh, really enjoying the worship and loving the Lord. And suddenly the Lord speaks to me and he says, I'm about to speak to you through this guy. He's a prophet. And I was like, a prophet? I thought he was a worship leader. And he says, you must pay attention to the very words. I'll put my very words in his mouth. And literally the Lord finished that conversation with me and he stopped in the middle of a song, broke in and just said, I feel like I've got a word for you. And he points to me and he starts prophesying these things. Uh, what he didn't know is behind the scenes, I had been already recognized as an, in an apostolic role into the nations. I'd worked with another group and had traveled much of the globe working into churches. Had left that group and was floundering now in the sense of what's the way forward. And I began to feel the Lord speak to me about starting something, but it was still buried deep in my heart. And, and so when he called me out and started prophesying that, there's a real sense of the Lord was confirming things that he had already spoken to me. Uh, and so what I did was I went from there, I came back to the local elders, submitted the word to them uh, and there was a witness in their hearts then also I had relationship with many who were seen to be apostles in the nations I met with them over the period of time uh, around the nations and just submitted the word to them did they witness with it and there was a unanimous witness right across every single leadership group I met um, and spoke to that I trusted and so we started 412 out of that word. Um, and it was a prophetic word that really changed my life, changed our lives, and in the end changed his life because he ended up years later hearing the Lord speak to him about coming in and actually joining us. And then now, you know, serves with us uh, in 412 and in Josh Jen. And it was an amazing thing of how a word, literally a prophetic word, shaped nations. And uh, just to see how the Lord does speak sometimes. And as we keep in step with him, the miraculous happens, the kingdom comes and the world's a different place.